Good time. morning, everybody. We'll, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll have a few guests coming in a little bit late. Um, so if they, once they come in, we'll just uh, allow them to sit there in the, in the back the back rows. Um, welcome to our sixth annual uh, Spanish language celebration. Uh, we have a special guest with us this morning, uh, Ms. Wendy Adelson. Um, she finished her master's degree at uh, Cambridge University uh, in international relations and also uh, came back to the United States thereafter and finished her law degree at the University of Miami. Since 2006, she has been involved in human rights and um, uh, representing minors for FSU and the University of Miami in different capacities. Um, she is the author of This Is Our Story, which is a, a book, a novel about uh, two young women who become the victims of sexual trafficking in the U.S. And she is here to share with us um, those stories. Uh, in addition to that, I should mention that this was the book that the Florida State University selected for their freshmen to read as part of their reading initiative. So please join me in welcoming Wendy Adams. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here, and it's so nice. I just finished signing one of the copies of one of your fellow students. Her, um, her son was assigned to read the book. I found out that although assigned to read the book, it doesn't necessarily mean they read the book. So you can't, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink. Um, but thank you all for being here um, and taking time out of your busy Tuesdays to learn a bit about advocacy on, on behalf of victims of trafficking. Um, I want to thank Dr. Emmanuel Alvarado for bringing me here and making this possible, and fellow Truman Scholar, Dr. Bob Vanderbilt, uh, for bringing me here, and Sue Adamski, too, for helping organize this whole, this whole venture. Thank you very much. Um, despite the fact that I taught at a law school, I actually really don't enjoy listening to myself speak. Um, I prefer to listen, so I intend to keep my remarks like a skirt, long enough to cover the essential material, short enough to still be a little bit interesting, and I will leave time for questions at the end. Um, I was telling Dr. Alvarado, I would love to know what is interesting to you all about this topic. Um, I've been speaking about human trafficking for about the last 10 years now, um, and usually, about 10 years ago, I would ask an audience, okay, who's heard of human trafficking? And I, would, I, I wouldn't see a single hand. Um, I've seen that change, so I'd like to ask all of you, who here has heard about human trafficking? Raise your hand. Oh, makes me so happy. That's excellent. So let's begin. Um, I've had a chance to do a lot of really interesting things over the last many years. And something I'm really proud about is writing the novel that Dr. Alvarado mentioned. Um, the novel was inspired by the work that I've done over the last decade or so, representing victims of human trafficking, but also advocating for immigrants in different contexts. So refugees, uh, asylum seekers, children who are fleeing abuse. And I've heard incredible stories, stories that motivated me to write this book. Stories of pain and of abuse, um, but also stories of tremendous courage, love, uh, humor, and inspiration. So I went to law school. I don't know if any of you are interested in law school, but we can definitely talk about that as well. I went to law school specifically with the plan in mind to become an advocate for immigrants and refugees because it was work that I saw as providing a voice for voiceless sectors of society. So writing this book for me it was a continuation of that effort. I worked with so many people whose stories had just never been told, and it was what I wanted to do to make sure that people knew about my clients and knew about their struggles and knew about their vulnerabilities and knew about why this happened. So the book is a softly fictionalized account of two particular, well, hundreds of clients that I worked with, but one of the, one of the main characters in the story is a young woman from rural Argentina, and she comes to the U.S. to live with a family, to work in their restaurant a little bit, and to hopefully attend school. That's her dream. She wants to learn English, she wants to go to school, and she wants to really make something of herself. And the second is a woman in her late teens who feels very sure she knows everything about the world, and she wants to come to the U.S. and become a movie star. She dreams of being an actress. So she actually comes to the U.S. through answering an ad to work in a Chinese restaurant in Atlanta. 
Um, and she plans to move directly to the silver screen from there, which obviously was a long shot, we, we know that, but for her, she had, she had very big plans. And the third character is a public interest lawyer that lives in the Florida Panhandle. So that was not really a big stretch for me. So you might be asking yourself, why did this lady write a book? Does she have anything better to do? Um, yes, yes I do, um, but I would tell you I decided to write a book for a few compelling reasons. The first is about human trafficking. So human trafficking is a signature issue in human rights for the 21st century, as you know, because all of you know about it already. It unites people on both sides of the political aisle. As much as there's vitriol in the immigration debate, you can find Democrats and Republicans find this one area that they can both agree on, that human trafficking is wrong, and it's an area of mutual compassion. And when I talk about trafficking, I'm speaking about sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And we're talking about the exploitation of a person's labor or inducement into the commercial sex industry through force, fraud, or coercion. So those elements are disjunctive. It could be any one of them, all three of them, two or three, but they're the important bits to remember. So we're talking about force, fraud, or coercion when we're talking about trafficking. Human trafficking is a huge problem, and they refer to it as one that's hidden in plain sight. It's estimated that in the U.S. alone, there are 100,000 to 300,000 uh, young women involved in domestic minor sex trafficking. So when they talk about domestic minor sex trafficking, it's kind of a term I'm a little bit uncomfortable with, but it's the term that's used, and so I'd like to just help define it a little bit for you so that when you hear it on the news or you see it in the media, you know a little bit about what that means. So domestic refers to U.S. foreign victims. It means all trafficking is happening here, but domestic minor sex trafficking means we're talking about young people who are from the U.S., who are living in the U.S., who are somehow involved in the commercial sex industry. I'm wary about the statistics when I tell you it's 100,000 to 300,000. It's not that those statistics aren't true. It's just that statistics are very, very hard to come by in terms of trafficking. One of the reasons is that people don't really self-identify as victims of trafficking. So, the government of the state of Florida was really trying to get a better picture of what was going on in terms of trafficking. We've heard the statistics that Florida is the third worst state in the country in terms of human trafficking. So the governor then asked uh, a group of us, I was working at the FSU Center for the Advancement of Human Rights, and he asked us to do a study across the whole state and figure out really what was going on in terms of trafficking. And so basically I worked with the team and we, we, we did this research, so we interviewed every state agency, law enforcement, judges, prosecutors, service providers, and then the victims themselves to find out how we can better provide services to victims of trafficking in Florida, how we can better prosecute traffickers, how we can better identify victims, um, what we can do. And so I discovered through this process, if I didn't know before, how important it was to include the voices of the people that this happens to. So you have everyone else sitting around the table trying to figure out, well, how do we, how do we find traffickers? How do, we, how do we punish them? How do we prevent this? But the most important people to talk to were the ones that were actually going through the whole process who this happened to. And they're the voices that were really missing for most of, the addition, for most of what was happening beforehand. So what we wanted to do was understand their stories and their perspective. We wanted to know how do they get into these, these situations? What are the vulnerabilities that lead to trafficking? What happens during the process of being trafficked? How do they get out? And then what happens next? Too much in the media or in movies, maybe some of you have heard about human trafficking from the movie um, Taken. I think they're up to Taken number seven now. They just keep making sequels. You know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of dramatization over, well, you just, you kick down the brothel door and everyone's free and then everything's fine. What I really wanted to do and, you know, what I learned about in the interviews and what I wanted to do with the book is really explain that what happens is a, is a really difficult and, and arduous and painful process when people are released from this process and then they have to figure out how to repair their broken lives and how to move forward in a country that is either their country or, or isn't, where they speak the language or they don't, where they have access to social services or they have no idea. Maybe they don't speak English, maybe they aren't literate, uh, maybe they can't drive a car. Um, there's so many aspects to living in a place that, that sometimes we can take for granted. So 
it's those, those next pieces of how do you fully care for someone who is trying to put together a life in a new place. So those are some of the questions that we tackled in our research and some of the questions that I try to, I try to uncover in, in my book. As um, Dr. Alvarado mentioned, a lot of the work that I've done over the years has focused on child advocacy um, or the intersections between immigration law and child advocacy. And so I've worked with a lot of children who have been abused, abandoned, neglected, or child victims of human trafficking. And so one issue with child trafficking that I've spent a lot of time on has to do with the, the actual definition of human trafficking. So the federal definition of human trafficking says any person under the age of 18 who's induced to perform a commercial sex act is a victim of trafficking. Up until recently, the statute in Florida, the state statute on prostitution, didn't make any differentiation based on the age of the person involved. So a person of any age engaged in prostitution is engaging in a criminal act and needs to spend some time in juvenile detention or if they're over 18, in jail. So we started getting calls at the Human Rights Center from law enforcement and we'd get a call from law enforcement. They'd say, I don't know what to do with this person I just found. Uh, are they a victim of human trafficking or are they a uh, criminal and do I need to charge them as such? So what do you do when you have federal laws and state laws that say two different things? And some of it has to do with the culture of trafficking. We think about victims of trafficking and, and our hearts soften a little bit. As I was saying, it's one of those issues that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. It's an area of mutual compassion. But there wasn't as much compassion surrounding people who they thought of as kids in prostitution, Pros, you know, prostitutes. That, that word had, had a real stigma around it. That wasn't, that wasn't a population that people were interested in providing services for, except that the law says that they're the same person. So that was, it's a complicated dynamic between federal, state, and state law, and something that we've been doing a lot of advocacy on around the state to try to help um, law enforcement understand what it means to be a victim of trafficking, what it means to have been induced into this commercial sex industry, and it's certainly something that we can talk about more in the, in the question and answer um, when I conclude these remarks. Um, and the final reason I wrote this novel about my client's lives is that human trafficking is happening all over the world, and it's happening all over the United States. I have a lot of people say things like, you know, this is people coming from other places. Well, sometimes it is, but it's also people who are vulnerable and other people who are trying to take advantage of people who are vulnerable. And that happens, people can be vulnerable whether they are from another country or whether they are from this country. Vulnerability is not dependent on your, uh, your immigration status. Um, so as I mentioned, Florida's thought of as the worst, worst, third worst state in the country, and that's because of the number of active cases we have uh, where people are investigating human trafficking right now. So I thought I would give you a few examples of cases that I've worked on, and they're cases that are happening in South Florida alone. Um, and I hate to say it, but these are just a few selected cases of the many cases that are currently happening in South Florida. But I chose them uh, because I know the people involved um, and because I was proud to have the chance to work on them, and also because they're pretty illustrative of some of the some of the situations that arise with trafficking, and they'll give us good fodder for things to talk about after. So the first is the Cadena case, uh, this family, the Cadena Sosa family. It was a case of commercial sex trafficking, and it was a family of traffickers from Veracruz, Mexico. And the very interesting thing about this case was that the head trafficker was the, was the matriarch of this family, and she was a 75-year-old grandmother from Veracruz, Mexico, and she had enlisted her sons, her daughters, her daughters-in-law, everyone in the family, this was a pure family business, doing this commercial sex trafficking. But she was the mastermind behind the entire operation. So basically, the Cadena Sosa family would go back to the city that they were from, to Veracruz, Mexico, and they would have the women from that family go back. And they would be dressed very nicely, in, in business suits, very professionally, and they'd have big diamond rings on their hands, and they would say to the parents of young girls there, look at me, I came from this neighborhood. We are doing so well. We have this restaurant in, in Miami, it's very successful. 
and I used to be just like your daughter. I didn't have anything, and now, look at us, we're, we're so successful. We could do this for your daughter too. And they would lay a few pesos on the table and they would say, this is nothing to me. This is just, just a, a, a down payment into what your, your daughter is gonna bring home. She'll live with us, we will take good care of her like she's our own, she'll go to school, everything will be great, and then she'll send money home to you and you'll be able to have a better life for her and a better life for you. And so parents wanting, as, as parents do, wanting what's best for their children, they sent them, trusting that these people are from my hometown, they know my family, they, they know us, they, they, wouldn't do, they wouldn't do wrong by us. And I'm sorry I get a little choked up because it's just, as a parent, you can't believe that other people would treat your children this way. Um, but they did, and so basically parents would let their young girls come thinking they were going to go to school, they were going to have a better life. And basically after they got to the US, the next stop was they took them to Kmart to buy lingerie and you know, cheap clothing that they, could, that they could wear. And they engaged in what we refer to as a, a brutal seasoning period where they, they got these young girls ready for the, the life that they were about to, to lead. Um, which was you know, basically seven days a week being involved in the commercial sex industry. So they were part of something called a mobile brothel unit. So basically they wanted to make sure that the girls didn't develop relationships past a few days with anybody that was going to, with anyone that would stick. And so they had the girls moving to different areas around South Florida and eventually all the way up the Eastern seaboard to South Carolina. Different, different place every few days, keep, keep them moving. So the women worked 12 hours a day. They were supposed to spend 15 minutes with each John or each, each customer at $20 per trick. It was 25 to 30 sex acts per day, six to seven days a week. And I talked to you about trafficking and what it means in terms of force, fraud, or coercion. There was so many different kinds of coercion involved. Obviously the initial fraud in terms of telling the parents and telling the families what this was going to look like. But the coercion, there, there were constant rapes, there were death threats, there was absolute isolation. They would tell them, you know how the police are in your country? You think the police are gonna help you here? You don't have immigration status. We have your papers. Who are you gonna tell here that's gonna believe you? They're gonna believe us, we're friends with law enforcement. They're not gonna believe you. They had no real under understanding of social service networks in the United States. And so the Cadena family earned $2.5 million off the backs of these young women in two years. So this case comes to light. It's time to be prosecuted. The person right under the grand grandmother, Rogerio Cadena, he received a 15 year sentence and the others received two to six years for sentences for what they did. The victims in this case, there were about 45 of them, were supposed to receive a million dollars in restitution. Restitution meaning they were never paid for any of this work that they committed. If you can call it work, it sounds a lot more like abuse to me, but again, there was money they were supposed to receive in restitution. We're still waiting, they have not received it yet. And many of the victims in this case very much wanted to return to Mexico but they didn't feel safe. They didn't feel like there was a place where they could go home to, where this family wouldn't know, where do I live, where's my family, are we safe? They really felt like the only way to be safe was to stay in the United States. So they had to choose for them the much harder path of staying here, trying to build new networks, trying to learn English. And that's still what they are doing today. So that was, that was the Kadena case. Um, the next case that I'd like to talk to you about is a labor trafficking case. I feel like when we hear about human trafficking, most of the cases we hear about are sex trafficking. Um, but it's important also to understand that labor trafficking is just as prevalent um, and that it doesn't get as much attention you know, in, in media or in, uh, in, in movies, but it does go on and it's important to understand what's happening. So there was actually a case in Boca Raton Involving, uh, involving workers from the Philippines. So basically what happened in November of 2007, there were over 50 workers from the Philippines who were brought by a husband and wife team. Uh, they're Filipino natives, but they've been living in the United States and their names were Sofia Manuel and Alfonso Balonado. And 
the owners of two employment leasing companies promised the workers free housing and full-time jobs at, in food service at a, at a Boca Raton country club. And the workers were all recruited in the Philippines from a Manila-based agency that specialized in providing laborers to the U.S. And the Filipino recruiters lured these potential workers with pictures of upscale Florida homes, beautifully manicured lawns, and images of Disney World. Now, how close is Disney World to Boca Raton? Not very. So that's, that's, where the, that's where one piece of the fraud comes in. So each of the workers recruited incurred debts of between $3,000 and $8,000 to try to come to the United States. The Filipino recruiting agency charged them the money up front, and then the workers were left to borrow the funds from family or from loan sharks in, to, in order to pay this initial recruiting fee. And they did it because they assumed they were going to be making back so much more, especially if they were living for free in this, in this beautiful place, they would work very hard and they would send that money back home. And one of the interesting pieces of this case is that all of the workers actually entered on valid visas. So they all came through a program called the H2B visa program, which we can, we can talk about a little more, but it's, it's interesting because you hear a lot of people talking about, well, they're illegally present or they, they put it in a way that's much less um, appropriate about you know, these people and these people being illegal, but the truth is they all came on legal visas. So upon their arrival, as you can imagine, a much different world awaited the migrant workers than the one they had seen in the brochures of beautiful homes and, and Disney World. Instead of the work and the accommodations, they had to find for themselves low-paying part-time jobs. And as many as 30 of them were living in a very tiny house in Boca Raton. The husband and wife team, Manuel and Maldonado, confiscated their passports and their return airline tickets and threatened them with deportation if they complained to anyone. The workers were not allowed to leave their house without permission, and money was routinely deducted from their earnings to supposedly cover everything. Cost of uniforms, transportation, visa renewal, food. After the weekly wage deduction, none of the workers earned a federal minimum wage. So in addition to their overcrowded living conditions, the newly arrived workers were provided with little to no food. It was only when they began begging for food donations at a local Catholic church that their plight was brought to the attention of the Honorary Consulate General, General of the Philippines in South Florida. He and his wife discovered that the 30 plus workers held in one Boca Raton house were sleeping in the yard, they were sleeping in the garage, they were sleeping in piles of garbage, and they were sleeping on the floor. In fact, a number of them were actually sorting through garbage cans looking for food when they were rescued. So a number of the victims expressed great fear of what the loan sharks back home in their country would do to their families if the loans weren't paid off. That was their greatest fear. And that's been my, the fear of most of my clients that I've worked with. They want to pay off their debt. It's the reason why they're here, most of them, is to make money, send it home, work hard, and be able to move on with the rest of their life. Um, a number of them were told that they would be prosecuted by the Filipino government if they abandoned the employer who had sponsored them for their H-2B visas. And that's actually how the system is set up, is once you have an H-2B visa, you're only permitted to work for one employer. So it gives that employer a lot of power to potentially, you hope not, but to potentially exploit the worker that's working for them. The husband and wife team, Manuel and Balonado, pled guilty to the federal charges and actually are still awaiting sentencing. And this forced labor case is useful to think about because it's testimony to the manner in which human trafficking can infiltrate legitimate Florida industries and a reminder of how human trafficking can exist even in the most upscale neighborhoods and country clubs and resorts and how victims can be found even in the most affluent neighborhoods. This was a nice house. This house just had 30 plus people living in and it was a house built for maybe four or five people to be living in it. They were exploding at the seams. This case is also useful because it provides a glimpse of how ripe for abuse the H-2B visa program is, especially for its lack of scrutiny regarding employers. So the very nature of the visa, as I mentioned, allowing the foreign worker to only work for one person creates a dependency relationship that, if, if tweaked the wrong way, really provides the employer with a chance to abuse their employee. The stories in my novel and the cases I discussed represent the faces behind the immigration debate and the work that many legal aid attorneys do um, representing exploited individuals every day. So
So as Dr. Alvarado mentioned, I used to run a law school-based legal clinic that provides legal services to patients at a community health clinic. And I'm, I used to exclusively represent victims of human trafficking and other immigrant victims of crimes, asylum seekers, and unaccompanied immigrant children. And I'm not doing that anymore because the funding dried up for my work and there was no funding for anyone to replace me. So that means that there are more immigrant kids who have to face a complex immigration system and face an immigration judge alone. And there are more persecuted asylum seekers who have to figure out how to navigate a complicated immigration system alone. And victims of trafficking will very often go without representation, unless some of you would like to go into this line of work, which would be great, and which I would like to talk to you about. And I apologize to the students who came a little bit late um, for missing a little bit of the beginning of the talk, but I'd now like to open it up to anyone who has questions, and you will not be publicly shamed uh, if I covered something that happened while you weren't here. So um, thank you for listening, and I'd love to answer any questions that you have. In 2007, the, the Filipino, Filipinos came, and they're still waiting for sentencing. So how, when did they find out? What, did you say, I'm sorry, if you no, did say. No, that's okay. Um, the case came to, it was in 2011 that the case was finally discovered. It took a long time to figure out what to do from there. Um, we just don't have a, we don't have a decision yet on, on what's going to happen, but the case is still moving and it's in process. It hasn't actually been solved. It's just, this is about how long trafficking cases can take sometimes. And it, it really shows how difficult it is on the victims who are here. Um, they often receive something called continued presence so that they're able to remain in the United States to assist with the investigation, to be present for um, trial, but their lives are basically in limbo, wondering what's going to happen with the traffickers. They still, they have to live with that level, that high level of uncertainty. Thank you. In the case of the Cadena Sosa family, um, how many of the girls would you say were drugged as part of their seasoning and, and grooming? Or was this happening in this particular case? It, it was happening. I'm trying to remember of the women that we worked with. So, yeah. I mean, I, I would say if, if we worked with maybe 12 young women, it was all of them experienced some, some period of, of being drugged uh, to be able to make it through what they were dealing with, yeah. Um, with the last case with the immigrant workers, what can happen to them? Would they be able to get another visa while they're still in the country to be able to work for another person? Or where are they now? Are they still living in America? Are they, like, what, what happens to them? Do they still have options, or are they just gonna, as soon as the child will, or be sent back? It's a great question. So basically one of the main things that I, I used to do uh, as part of my job was help people who had been trafficked apply for something called a T visa. So thankfully Congress has carved out an option for people who are stuck in this situation. Um, and I, I alluded to it with talking about continued presence there for a second. But basically the T visa stands for trafficking visa. And the idea is that if you are at least willing, you don't even have to be useful to the investigation, but if you are at least willing to assist with the investigation, um, even once the investigation is over, you are permitted to stay in the United States and work towards a permanent status. So the naysayers about this visa say, well, everyone's gonna be claiming they're a victim of human trafficking. And it's, well, it's not that simple to say you're a victim of trafficking. There's a large amount of documentation that occurs. There are a number of special agents that work with the human trafficking unit of the Department of Homeland Security to assess cases to make sure that this is an actual case that's going on. Um, but there is this visa available. So before the visa existed, if you came on an H-2B and things didn't work out with your employer, you needed to go home. There was nothing available for you and you were in a really bad situation. 
especially because you don't want to get blacklisted. The only reason why you're coming to work here on a seasonal basis is because you need to. You wouldn't, you wouldn't leave your home to go work in really tough conditions on a seasonal basis if you could make enough money where you lived back home. You would stay with your family and your country if you had a good viable job, but they didn't, and so they came. Um, and so thankfully, I shouldn't say thankfully they were trafficked, obviously it's a horrible situation. Thankfully Car Congress has created a visa that provides for people who get stuck in this situation. Hi, um, I have a question. The young ladies from Veracruz, Mexico, what were their ages? Uh, yeah, we re of the ones we represented, they were as young as 10 mm -hmm. and as old as 16. That was the, young, the oldest person. Um, and it's worth, since you asked that question, it's worth mentioning. So when I mentioned for a T visa that you had to be willing um, to assist in the investigation, if you were under age 18, as all the girls were, on, were in this case, and you were um, and you were a victim of sex trafficking as opposed to labor trafficking, you do not actually need to assist in the investigation. Now, some of the girls, especially the older ones, old, towards 16, the older ones, um, they felt so strongly that they wanted to make sure that this didn't happen to anyone else, that they wanted to. They wanted to participate and they wanted to punish the people who did this. Um, but because of fear of re-traumatization and needing to tell these hor horrible stories over and over again, they actually don't require them to do it, which I think is pretty forward thinking um, for when they created the visa. Uh, Wendy, I, I do have a few questions for you. Um, it seems kind of unfair. You I, have your own mic. I do. <laughs> You're um, a professor, but go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, but the first question is, uh, do you know in the sex trafficking case, how was it that the family found the clients? Um, and were the clients also prosecuted? Good question. Um, how is it that the family found the clients? They, um, they knew the families. So they, they knew them from home. They looked to see which families had young girls and which families were really, really suffering from abject poverty, right? So when I say in terms of looking for vulnerabilities, you look for the people that are most vulnerable and figure out how to exploit their need. And that, that's what they did. It's a criminal act. Um, in terms of whether the girls were punished, thankfully in this case, and I think maybe due to the fact that the children were so young, so there isn't that sort of question of, well, is this, you know, is this a person that should have known better? Is this a prostitute or is this a victim? Due to the very young age of the girls, thankfully, none of them were prosecuted for being involved in, in, in prostitution. Thank you. Um, during the process of um, the 45 girls being trafficked, how were they family reached, um, like, of course, during the time that they were away, their families wanted to speak to them and see how they were doing. So how exactly did the people, did the family in charge like contact their families and talk to them? Or were they reached after they were found and stuff and found out exactly what happened? So you're talking about the case we had mentioned first, the young girls from Mexico. Um, they were allowed to make calls, but only when the traffickers were present. So they were allowed to call home, and when they were, they were there was someone standing right there. So when your family says, how is everything going? You say, everything is great. Are they treating you well? Yes. Are you eating enough? Yes. They were standing right there. So the amount of control, the amount of psychological coercion going on, they were allowed to speak to their families, but they weren't really allowed to freely communicate with them. So the, the families had absolutely no idea what was going on. Uh, up here. I want to ask you, um, what is the difference between a prostitute, which is controlled by a person taking, taking their money, and yeah. a victim of sexual abuse? It's a wonderful question, um, and it sounds like it should be a simple question, but it's actually one of the questions at the core of a lot of the tension in the human trafficking debate. Um, so. As I was mentioning, human trafficking, you have Democrats and Republicans you know, lining up together, but you do have a lot of disagreement at an ideological level about what is human trafficking. So 
when it comes to children, the definition is quite simple. You can point to the legal definition and say, person under the age of 18 induced into induced to perform a commercial sex act, that person can be induced by a trafficker, by a pimp. They often use the same term synonymously. The pimp is the trafficker in that situation. Um, the definition when you're dealing with someone over 18 is that force, fraud, or coercion has to be present. So some people will say, well, it's not like the person is choosing between being an ophthalmologist and going into prostitution. It's, of course, the, the choice is coerced by economic necessity. So that person is not freely choosing to go into prostitution. Therefore, all prostitution is trafficking because it's all coerced by something. And that is, that is something that a lot of people, that's a belief that a lot of people have. Then you have the other side that says, well, you can't call everything prostitution. Trafficking is when you have this additional level of force, fraud, or coercion, and it's different. Where I think it becomes very murky is what do you do when you have someone that entered into this life, into the commercial sex industry when they're 14? And you find them, not when they're 18, but when they're 19. So at 19, was that your next question, yes. right? So, I mean, the answer, the answer to what the law says and, and how we maybe feel about it and what the, what the disagreements are over it, are, it's, a, it's a little murkier. I mean, the law says that unless you, have, unless you can show force or fraud or coercion, that that is prostitution and that is to be punished as a criminal offense. But it's murky. And part of your job as an attorney or as an advocate is to figure out how you advocate for a person and how you say, but there was coercion. Let me explain to you what coercion looks like in this situation. And you figure out a way of how do you creatively advocate for someone. This is what the law says. You can't, you can't change the laws. That's a longer process. But when you're working with the law as it is, you figure out how can I creatively move around this to help my client to help a person who's in this situation and is clearly vulnerable and somebody else is trying to exploit their vulnerability and how do I how do I advocate for them? Because I was thinking of those young women that they uh, it happened what happened to them and uh, unfortunately some of them might go back to what they experienced just because of lack of money Absolutely. and lack of schooling and lack of any kind of support, family yeah. or financial support from the United States government. Right. And they might go back and they might be over 18 and then they will end up in jail. Yes. And they will have no rights. So thankfully, at least for the sex trafficking statute, there's no statute of limitations on the crime. So, and, and one thing we've seen is we've been doing a lot of education in law enforcement. So we have a lot of well-educated law enforcement, especially in South Florida, about human trafficking. And we get calls now of people who say, woman, she told me the story, I think you should come in and talk to her and see if maybe you can help. And so if you can find out that this girl who's now 24, what was originally one of these young women from Veracruz, Mexico, was in this situation, you can, you can get her a T visa and be able to help her. With a T visa, you can have a work authorization and eventually have the ability to travel. You have, you have a lot more means for getting a decent job. You can also have your record expunged. So what happens a lot with young people who get charges of prostitution or other charges, a lot of times you have the pimps or traffickers forcing the girls to uh, engage in petty theft offenses. You get a number of them on your record, you can't get a job after that. So one of the things we've been trying to work on is helping get records expunged so that people can actually have a fresh start and be able to move forward and not go right back into the only life they knew and the only way to make money that they knew, which was essentially them being abused. And the other thing you asked about, how do you tell the difference between what's, what's abuse um, and what's prostitution? That's always been a really interesting question for me because at, as a society, we kind of talk about these questions of child abuse. And it's sort of like I mentioned before, how we say like victim of trafficking, child abuse is something that is, you know, tears at our heartstrings. Whereas, you know, prostitution isn't always something we think, well, that's just a bad kid. That's someone, you know, doing something wrong. And the only difference we see with child prostitution and abuse is money exchanges hands. So just because money exchanges hands doesn't mean it's not inherently abusive. Um, so that's sort of my, my response to that. Um, I see some more questions. Um, do, do we have more questions? Yes. With the um, child trafficking, um, how do they expose the girls to these guys? Like, do they post them on 
the computer, tell them about it, like, what do they do? Because I mean, how can something like that goes on for many years and nobody knows about it? Yeah, um, and I'm not, I'm not here to publicly shame you, but did you walk in a little bit late? No, you were here for I just didn't know if you heard the story yeah. of the traffickers going to Mexico and how they no, found I mean, them. Like, how does the guys know about those girls that scam? Oh, how do the how do the Johns know? Yes, yeah. how do the Johns? How do the Johns? Oh, so yeah, many different years. ways. But the one that you mentioned is definitely one. So you've got the issue of the internet, right? So you've got uh, has anyone heard about Backpage.com? Excellent issue. Okay, so the internet is a great first one that you mentioned. So certainly there are people also they call um, who are in the life who are out on the streets. You can see people on the streets, but in terms of the girls and if they're you know perhaps being kept or someone has a business with um, with young women, they will post on uh, Craigslist has a special sort of adult only section called Backpage.com. I wrote a little article called Children Don't Belong on the Backpage about so that's my feeling about it. Um, but basically, you can purchase um, underage people for sexual acts on Backpage.com, and it exists. And so there's also a whole debate on this of whether perhaps it's good for law enforcement to be able to, when people purchase other people online, they have to type in their credit card information and it actually provides a really good perch for law enforcement to find the perpetrators and to be able to uncover them and potentially stop it from happening. So the arguments on both sides, you know, one side is it's a First Amendment right. Uh, you know, you're allowed to do this. Um, it's good for law enforcement to find the perpetrators. The argument on the other side is, you know, our, our constitution wasn't created so that we can purchase young people for sex. Uh, that this, if this was your, you know, mother or daughter or sister, that this isn't something you would ever want to happen. So that is one, one place. Um, as I mentioned, uh, another place is all the, the you know, is, all the other sources of media so you have we've had cases where um, people printed up business cards and they would pass them out and it made it look like a taxi it would look like a taxi card except it had like the silhouette of a woman on the side and that was what one of the mobile brothels up in Tallahassee would use but they would pass out this these cards at bars and nightclubs and there's a lot of construction in the area and so a lot of the recent immigrants who had come they would pass these out at local cantinas and local bars and restaurants to try to pick up customers. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay, over here. Okay. I was here since the beginning, but I might have missed this. Um, how long were they able to, in the first scenario, how long were they able to keep the operation going? Because it seems like I understand that they kept going back and are they sending money little bits to keep people thinking it's going well? Because I have a hard time believing that people in, you know, aren't spreading around, hey, it doesn't seem like it's going well, we're not hearing anything, we're not, you know, yes, they're getting the phone calls, but how long were they able to keep this you know, charade going? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, two years, I went on for two years. Um, so for two years, people were, I mean, if they believed it the whole time, that's that's another story. But they, you know, they heard somewhat frequently from their children. They told them that it was okay. They said the money's coming. They would send them drips, and they were kind of pushing them off for that amount of time. And they would send they would send money periodically, little bits of money, just to kind of keep them keep them appeased and keep it going. making you work. Mm -hmm. So the Johns used uh, internet sites. You tried to use credit cards. They Not in these two particular cases I mentioned, but in other cases. Right, in other cases. Mm -hmm. And um, you track down the Johns. You tell them you had sex with an underage you know, woman or girl. They're underage. Do you prosecute them as just somebody who's had sex with, with through prostitution? Or do you prosecute them as a sexual offender? You're asking a very good question. So I am not personally a prosecutor, right? So it wouldn't be me that's doing it. I represent the victims with benefits that they get, but I'm part, part of the process. Um, one of the things we did over the past few years was help change the laws on this. Um, and it feeds into one of the larger debates about who are, like, how do you handle the demand side? What do you do about the demand for sex? Do you, do you punish the people the, that are actually you know, visiting the prostitutes? Because if you punish them and you shame them, then perhaps they don't do it anymore and then demand dries up and, 
and you've got a better situation, um, we have increased penalties for traffickers. So we now have laws on the books in Florida that say if you go and visit, if you are customer client, John, there's all different words and they all are loaded in their different ways. Um, if you go and, and, and engage in this behavior and the person is underage, your penalty is higher. Um, if that person is being held as a victim of trafficking, your penalty is even higher. Um, what I would like to see is, is penalties for visiting prostitutes in general. I was just um, I was just up at Indiana University and I was giving a talk and I checked out their local vice unit in Indiana and what they're doing. They're doing something now where they never put the pictures of the prostituted women online, but they are putting pictures of the Johns online. They call it like a name and shame scenario. So when the when the Johns get picked up, it doesn't have to be underage, but they do um, they do put their pictures online um, for visiting. So different states are doing different things. This question of prostitution is still a state by state question and still part of criminal law. So you have states saying all different kinds of things. That you have some states saying it's only prostitution if the person is under 14. It's only prostitution if the person is under 16. The, the ages are, or it's 18. They're all over the place. All 50 states do something very different. So we clearly haven't created a national consensus on the issue yet, but people are definitely, with the, with the rise of interest and knowledge about human trafficking, people are definitely thinking about it thinking about the issue more and kind of understanding more of these nuances involved with, you know, this isn't just a person committing a crime, is this a person being abused? Is this a person, you know, who started this when they were a kid and still kind of stuck in this situation? What's, you know, what's going on? Do we have any more questions? Yes. So in my fantasy world, I see thousands of people um, identifying one of these mobile units or a trailer, yeah. and I understand that there's some armed guards outside of them. Sometimes, yes. Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. But in my fantasy world, I see thousands of people coming to one of these trailers and picketing outside. Yeah. Why wouldn't that work? I think that would work. You think it would work? I do. I love this fantasy world. It's <laughs> nice. I want to live there. It, um, it hasn't happened yet, so when I mentioned it's an issue of, you know, an industry that's hidden in plain sight, usually right. people don't know what's going on there. They but really they don't. Were, so you think that there were a systematic effort to try to identify where these places were going, and if people became involved, yeah. and we just went out there and picketed it, yeah. um, you know, kind of the taking the risk. Well, super well, exciting. That, that's, that's one of the things, but right. I, okay. I mean, the police... I, don't, I think we would only need to pick it because law enforcement wasn't doing their job, and law enforcement is super gung-ho about doing their job, about ferreting this out and ending this kind of crime. So, I don't know. If they're not doing their job, though, you know, would, would citizens kind of take up arms? I know a lot of people, I think, who would. And I don't know, I see some people with hands up. So, um, here in the room and then in the green, too. I have a question about the other case, so I Question about this. Is the other one a follow up to this question? Well, I wanted to ask you the agencies that they take the workers offer them, offer them H2B visas. Is it legal for them to charge for their accommodation? No, no, it's totally exploitative. Mm -hmm. You can't charge for their accommodations. Okay, because that is happening a lot. And um, I was an H2B visa. Okay, and so it. If there is a contract where you say, we are going to charge you X amount, and this is your lodging, this is how much it costs you, you know, up front you sign your contract, that's a legal and binding contract. I'm saying they tell them it's free. You come over here and it's However, free. However, I did not know that uh, when I signed the contract, paying for the accommodation was exact the same agency that you pay to bring you here, that you pay to um, the connection between you and the employer. So it was kind of monopolizing, I think, is yeah. the word. Yeah. Like the, they, you will leave with other people in the house, and if you want to break the contract and move on your own, you won't be allowed. And then when everything tried, uh, kind of like being discovered, they changed the name of the company, which is very odd. Yeah. And then uh, I'm talking about hundreds of workers that they go in places, as you said, high class places like Boca Vista, Cuba, like. I know about 600 employees that they come from from different countries and they go there and they live six or eight in the same house, which is okay because there are two people sharing the room, 
However, it's about you and it's about the signed contract and you're not allowed to break it even though even though the rules are not explained to you very fairly from the beginning. So those things are still happening a lot. Yeah, those things are still happening and what you're and what you're explaining and what I tried to allude to, but I think you did a much better job of it having a personal experience with it, is just the inherent exploitation that's part of the H2B visa process. So it's not illegal, and what you're describing isn't necessarily trafficking, but it sure as heck is exploitative. It's really not okay. Again, right? So is that trafficking? No. Is it exploitative and problematic? Yes. Uh, it's, is anyone doing anything about it? There's a lot of people who are, and I can definitely connect you with, with people or around the state we who, are doing, <laughs> who are doing advocacy to try to improve the H2B visa process because a lot of people don't know, and your voice would be really important to, to add to the conversation of how inherently exploitative the process is. And that's a process we call legal. We're not calling that trafficking, we're just saying there are potential issues with it. Because I think people, when they come here now and they don't know what is going to happen to yeah. them, it doesn't matter, even if they're not trafficking anyone, right. they still have rights and they still right. should be protected in a country and on a land that is it's the land of freedom right. to have a word to say and to have a matter of speaking that, in that matter. Yes, and you bring up an important point too. You know, a lot of times people think about human trafficking, like, oh, it's, you know, it's the worst thing that can happen. It's, it is uh, on a continuum of how you can exploit and mistreat other people. Human trafficking is pretty far at one end. But there is a continuum of the way you can mistreat other people. And when I talk to kind of younger kids, school kids about this, I say I, I think it starts with a place like bullying, right? When you start to think that you that other people are, are less than you and not as good as you, that's that's where this starts. And then it gets all the way to the other end as viewing somebody else as as a commodity, right? As a, another person is just a way for you to make more money. And they're not even human anymore. And that's how we get things like genocide and things like human trafficking. But the exploitation of an H2B, H2B visa process is definitely in there. How do we exploit other people like this and think that this is somehow legal and okay? Because there are a lot of legal things that can make a difference, like uh, even the hourly rate, right? Exactly. Or the accommodation, mm -hmm. the meals, right. the insurance, and overall rights right. that people will have. I'm with you. I think we just take it over to the fantasy land. Where we advocate for a better world. Hi, my question is a little bit off topic. Uh, That's okay, I'm it's here. Nagging at me. When you said that you had been doing this and you talked about these cases right at the end, you said that the funding dried up. Um, what is it that you do now that you no longer do that? Do I you actually still do the same thing, or yeah, no, I, I'm actually doing immigration uh, work for families and employers right now. So I'm I'm doing private immigration work mainly because of of a personal family situation, I, I moved to Miami, so I'm now in South Florida instead of Tallahassee. Um, but the funding did drop for my work, and I ended up teaching at the university instead of directly and, and running the clinic for a few years instead of doing this. Um, the funding dried up. I was funded by the Florida Bar Foundation, which funds a lot of nonprofit or legal aid um, advocacy for attorneys around the state of Florida to advocate for people that otherwise wouldn't have access to attorneys and can't afford them. And so we would do our work pro bono. The Florida Bar Foundation would, would pay our salaries and we would be able to serve clients who couldn't otherwise pay um, for the work that they needed. So the funding dried up mainly when uh, you know we had the economic downturn. There was no longer that money. And so that's it. <laughs> the jobs dry up and that's it. Um, Thankfully, the, the economy is turning around a little bit. Um, we're also finding a patchwork of ways to encourage private law firms to do some of that funding, and a lot of them are doing great work to take on pro bono cases, but it's, it's not enough. It's never enough. And so we always need more people to go into law and be able to take on some cases and do this kind of work so that kids and other people who are vulnerable are able to have someone help guide them through a really complex system. Yes, Scott. Can I use mic? Yeah, it's pretty loud. I don't like the mic. Oh, maybe you don't need the mic. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, I had a question. When you are a U.S. flight patrol, you lobby to make better rules for people who come into the country and then labor. Uh, is there ever a worry that the rules that you'll change now 
will create hardships in the future. Like when I came here, I needed, I became a citizen through adoption. So my parents were citizens. And then I tried to go get a passport, and it took me a year and a half because now you need a certificate of naturalization to get your passport. So they changed it, and now it just created a lot more problems for someone like me, where I, I couldn't leave the country, and I lost a lot of opportunities that I could get a passport. So that way, like, a common fear is like, well, if we set it now, or maybe people won't even risk having uh, foreign laborers come into the country because it's like, well, look at what happened if something goes wrong and comes back on us. Let's keep everything here. Right. I mean, I just think at this point, there's no way to, America is an attractive place to be. There's no way to stop the interest in coming to our country to work, nor would we really want to. I mean, this is a country of immigrants, and nobody is whether it's from big business or even people who are anti-immigrant are not interested in stopping immigration totally. So that's not, that's that's never gonna be an option. In terms of changing the laws and then thinking later that we shouldn't have changed them, I mean, it sounds like your situation is pretty specific. I don't know the reasons behind needing that certificate of naturalization. Um, it sounds like, you know, a really annoying bureaucratic hurdle that happened and affected your life really negatively and was very frustrating for you. Um, you know, some of these laws that are getting changed are more to, you know, one of the things we did in Florida was make it easier for child victims of trafficking to have to prove their cases. So instead of having to do a higher burden, they were able to do a lower burden and didn't have to talk to law enforcement. I can't really envision a scenario where that comes back and we say, I wish kids really had to try harder to prove that they had been trafficked. That seems, um, that seems unlikely. I mean, I'm sure we make mistakes and we'll look back and say, maybe we should change it and at that point, you can change the law again. Um, if society changes enough to need something else, then you can do that. Um, but it's, you know, it's a good question and certainly that's why you can continually change those type of things because society evolves and we need different laws to address different problems that aren't always anticipated. I'm from Massachusetts. I moved here um, to Florida 18 years ago. And just recently, the churches that I've, heard, I've gone to have been very involved in exploiting it and making it, you know, um, Christ Fellowship is really big on that too. They're, try they're trying to help. Yeah. And that's where I first heard of it. Mm -hmm. And the faith-based communities have been a, an enormous resource Especially, you know, when I mentioned in the beginning of my talk about the governor asking us, well, what are, what are service providers doing to assist victims of trafficking? One of the hugest helps we have are is the faith-based community is saying, you know, people having drives saying, what do people need? Can we, you know, what can we donate? Do people need clothing? Um, faith-based communities, university communities, school communities, and people volunteering saying, you know, do people need uh, English classes? Do they need transportation? Do they need clothing? Do they need beds? Um, so much of the support that we've gotten for our clients over the years has been through donations and through public education and through and through churches. So that's, um, I spend a lot of time actually talking at different churches and, and, and trying to educate people about what's going on. And so do all of the people that are similarly situated to me who have worked with actual victims of trafficking and want to get the word out of how do we help them and how do we create you know a culture of people who are going to rally around the brothels if they knew about them and say this is not this is not the future we want for our children. Do we have any other questions? I, I just want to take the opportunity to uh, thank you, Professor Adelson, for coming to Palm Beach State College, uh, leaving behind uh, two small children on spring break uh, to well, I, come I here. Them alone. <laughs> uh, but, but we really appreciate your being uh, willing to come and share with our students uh, the life's work that you have been involved with. And I want to personally thank you very much for coming.